Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. God bless you, everyone. And it's uh, what a blessing. What an amazing, amazing gift uh, to be back here in the pulpit preaching uh, to the Way Church and uh, to all of you who've been praying and wishing me and our family well wishes and happy birthdays. Just thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, it has been a, a good time of reprieve and we still got a little ways to go before we uh, get through this season of transition and certainly uh, this election season is coming up and uh, been busy, busy at work, uh, attempting to fulfill some of these responsibilities. But nevertheless, uh, it is wonderful to be able to uh, bring to you a word from the Lord this morning, uh, a word that I think is uh, very apropos for the time of the season in which we are uh, pressing through. And certainly to the ministry team here at The Way, uh, Pastor Tanisha, Pastor Donna, Minister Mike, uh, Minister Adrian, Minister Wayne, the whole team. I just want to thank y'all for continuing to hold it all down. Uh, just put in the chat some gratitude and thanksgiving to the the leaders and the, the ministers and the pastors here at the Way Church that continue to ensure that even as we endure the multiple colliding pandemics, that we have ministry that is uh, blessing us to the core of our soul. And uh, so we're going to continue on in that vein. I'm going to uh, grab a hold of these lectionary passages for today. I was uh, caught between both of these passages. And as I prepared this week, I, I, I found myself wanting to braid the messages of these passages uh, to help bring forward a, a, a message, hopefully, of encouragement, but also a, a message of, of, of uh, advice for how to endure these uh, difficult times and seasons. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter number 22. We're going to read the first 14 verses, and then we're going to turn over to the book of Philippians. All right, the book of Philippians, uh, chapters four, um, chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. So two passages of Scripture, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. This is what the word of the Lord reads in Matthew chapter 22. Again, remembering that Jesus is speaking uh, to the people. He is wrapping up some of his ministry uh, here on earth. He is making his way towards the cross, towards the betrayal, towards the culmination of his ministry. And Jesus is, is speaking in parables because too often folks couldn't understand the words that were coming out of his mouth. <laughs> Praise God. And so he had to he had to speak in parables to help people appreciate the simplicity of the gospel, but the complexity of what it means to actually live it out. Uh, this this is a fascinating uh, rhetorical and pedagogical tool that Jesus uses throughout his ministry, uh, stories with earthly kinds of expressions that contain an eternal and a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus speaks to the people as he's teaching them. Verse number one of Matthew 22, Jesus spoke to them again in a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son, and he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, talking about the servants, and they went off, one to their field, another to their business, and the rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them, and the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Verse number eight, then the king said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. The wedding hall was ended up filled with guests. Verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes, had on the wrong dress code, praise God. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing 
of teeth. Man, you want to talk about a set tripping up in there, right? Man, you know, it's kind of like you mad folk didn't come, then you're mad at the folks who did come. Uh, but 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 it, it's a it's a important principle. Verse number 14 is really the crux of the matter that I want to take from this particular passage. It simply says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called but few are chosen. Philippians chapter number four, verse number four, simply says like this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, somebody say every, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, with which transcends and passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse number eight, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think about such things. Yes, and whatever, verse number nine, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, let us say thanks be to God. So we, we're going to uh, speak from the topic simply today. My mind is playing tricks on me. Mm, my mind is playing tricks on me. Let's pray, God. We want to say thank you for the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. My mind is playing tricks on me. Uh, I, I am so... Uh, mindful that uh, yesterday and certainly I would say this whole weekend has been a mental health awareness day, awareness weekend, uh, and I think it comes at no better of a time as we are persisting now through the sixth month, if you will, of our sheltering in place, perhaps our seventh month of sheltering in place and continuing to deal with the challenges of the pandemic, the challenges of the, as some are calling the racial reckoning that has been uh, thrust upon us, the political environment with elections, the rise of uh, white nationalism, and certainly the continued daily struggles that we have in our communities. Gun violence is uh, ravaging parts of Berkeley and Oakland and and much of the work that we've done through the years has, has found itself uh, particularly challenging. Our relationships are strained. Our children are whew, struggling to uh, 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 endure virtual learning in school. And so mental health, mental health is such an important part of what it means for us as followers of Jesus to be mindful of what it means to love God with your heart, your soul, your body, and your mind. That in many respects, the loving of God with our mind requires a kind of caretaking that you would do with other things that you claim to love. I mean, you know, I, 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 I have all kinds of things that I claim to love, uh, claim to love my family. I claim to love my, my, my 49ers. I claim to love my Lakers, even though I'm not a big LeBron fan. But, hey, we're going to get another ring, and, uh, you know, it's going to just count on, on the docket. Somebody say amen, right? I claim to love where I'm from. I claim to love the, 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 the folks that I'm in relationship with. I claim to love my church. And all of these things that I claim to love requires some caretaking. 
that uh, somebody uh, said that, you know, uh, love is an action word. It is a verb. It is not something that is static. It is something that requires some caretaking. Well, it is indeed the case that loving God with our mind in perilous times requires caretaking. It requires us to be serious about the cultivating of our mind. The scripture tells us very plainly that uh, we ought not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I, 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 I find this to be such an important part of our preaching and teaching and formation in this season because challenging times put strains on our minds. Challenging times. They strain our mind. And when your mind is strained, how many of you know you don't think the way you do when you don't have that pressure on your mind? I wish I could talk to somebody in here about, about how clear thinking you are when you ain't as stressed out in your mind. Well, here we have this uh, important saying. It's, it's attributed to, to Mahat, Mahat, Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi, Lord have mercy. But there is also a, a earlier attribution to a third century Chinese uh, mystic uh, named Leo Taz. And, and he says it like this, watch your thoughts for they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. That much of what we will be starts with the way we think. It starts in our mind. The proverb says it like this, as a man thinketh in their heart, so are they. Bushwick Bill, I mentioned it already in the Ghetto Boys, they, they simply said, my mind is playing tricks on me. Do you know, child of God, that your mind, our minds, our thoughts are perpetually moving and going throughout the day and even into the night. Experts estimate that the mind thinks between 60 and 80,000 thoughts a day. I want you to think about that. Amen. Your mind, it has 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. That's an average of 3,000 thoughts per hour. Lord, have mercy. That, that's pretty incredible, right? Other experts, they estimate a smaller number, 50,000 thoughts per day, which still means that's about 2,000 thoughts per hour. So between the time you wake up and the time you go to sleep and wake up again, your mind has processed over 50,000 thoughts. I want you to ask yourself, who is getting all of the thoughts of your mind. Uh, who is getting the lion's share of the thoughts that are moving through your mind? Because quiet as it's kept, child of God, that you will have all kinds of thoughts that are a result of the access of information that comes your way. But it is not the case that every thought is equal. That in many regards, our greatest task in seasons of challenge is to not be overwhelmed by the thoughts that are perpetually coming through our minds. That for you and I, we are called to ask ourselves, how can I ensure that even though the masses of thoughts rush into my mind, I will be mindful that I will only meditate on a few of them at a time. Yes, yes, yes. That, that, that it is a part, a part of our discipleship and discernment process that I will not be overwhelmed by the thoughts that are uninvited into my life. 
the information that floods and comes to me that I did not ask for. Any of you ever been in a situation where you get exposed to information that you did not ask about? You did not ask for it. You ever been in, a, in an environment and, and you got exposed to something that you knew you weren't ready to handle? Lord, if I could help somebody in here today. That, 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 that you were prematurely exposed to trauma, prematurely exposed to information, prematurely exposed to ideas that your mind was not ready to handle. And what did it do? It caused a great obstacle that for some are still trying to get beyond. Well, I want you to know that in this way, it is important for you and I to always appreciate that the masses of thoughts, the masses of people, the masses of experiences that you and I may have to engage with. Yes, they are many, but as the subtle uh, lesson in the parable tells us, only few are chosen. That you may have many invitations, and you may have many experiences, and you may have access to many ideas, but only a few deserve to be chosen to be meditated upon in your mind. What are the many people, what are the many thoughts, what are the many actions in your life which need to be pared down to the chosen few? That's, that's what I want to talk to you about today. How can you and I pare down the thoughts and the, the, the weighty matters that are in our minds, that weigh on us, how can they be pared down to the chosen few? And, and, and even more specifically, how do I get from the many to the chosen few? How do I get from the many to the chosen few? Few. Well, the Pauline text becomes quite instructive, and I really like the way Paul talks about it because Paul says, finally, beloved, whatever, somebody say whatever, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent. If there is anything praiseworthy, think about these things. I love how Paul uses these these both uh, uh, massively expansive words, but then also gets very clear with a definitive word. He starts with the masses, but then gets down into the specific. And it helps me to reflect on this idea that not every choice is consequential, but every choice has a consequence. That not every choice you will make in your life will be a consequential choice, which means that it will have a a make or break weight to it. It will have something that will be a radically disruptive or, or, or instructive impact on your life. Not every choice is like that, but every choice you make will have a consequence. And only time will tell how consequential your consequence is. Yes, you got to put some time on it. Amen. They say, I got five on it. You got to say, I got time on it. Oh, you ought to just put that in the chat. I'm putting some time on it. I'm putting some time on you. I'm putting some time on them. I'm putting some time on that. I'm putting some time on it. Yes, indeed. Only time will tell how the consequence lives out in your life. And that's why you got to just Be patient through the journey of your life. Don't get in a hurry because you're overwhelmed with thoughts. Don't get in a hurry because you're overwhelmed with ideas. No, slow the process down. And in the meantime, go deep into your formation. Go deep into the ways in which you are being formed after the ways of Jesus. Why? Because formation over time will determine who you become as you continue to make the choices you make. Yes, as you continue to make the choices, how you are being formed will help 
determine who you will become. And I'm here to tell you, child of God, it is the will of the Lord. No matter what consequences you have in your life, no matter what consequential things happen in your life, it is the will of God for you to be formed after the image and the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That in many respects, the life that you are living is a reminder that you are the clay. And God is the potter, and God knows how to take everything in your life and in my life and in our lives. And as long as we keep our lives in the hands of God, God will form us how he will. And how many of you know when God gets to forming you, you will end up all right? Lord, help me in here today. You ought to just pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. Why? Because my life is in the hand of the potter God, and God won't form me into something that will not give him some glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, so child of God, it's important for you to focus in on your formation. And this is so important in this moment because what forms us? Well, the things that form us is information. Yes, information helps to form us. Our, our, our experiences are often information bits that get put into our minds and and they create structures and they create uh, 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 thought patterns and processes that help us come to a certain conclusion. And how many of you know that sometimes the information we accept, the, it, it, it short circuits our ability to cease the mind tricks that are happening to us. I, I was listening or, or watching uh, the, this documentary or this, this uh, 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 movie on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And if you haven't watched it, all of you, particularly parents, you should watch this, 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 uh, this documentary on the impact of social media and Facebook and, and, and Instagram and Google and Reddit and, and all these fascinating kinds of things. I remember when I was at Duke and, and I used to uh, take some classes in some of the other schools. Uh, I was in the public policy school and I was in the, in the social welfare school. And I remember sitting in a couple classes in the School of Business, the FUQA, F-U-Q-U. A school. And they talked even in that class in 2003 and 4 of, of, of the ways in which marketing and the, 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 the uh, ways ads and advertisements are created to help you and I uh, make decisions about things that we don't necessarily need to buy. That they were training students at Duke on how to create messages, ads, how to play certain music, how to tap into your subconscious, to give you information that would trigger certain responses of thirst, of, 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 of envy, of, 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 of need and want. And, 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 and you, you, you find yourself uh, feeling like, man, I really want some, some soda. And the paradox is that the soda actually makes you more thirsty. Lord, have mercy. Ain't it something how there are people who are being trained how to feed information to you and me and us that will seek to give a certain kind of infrastructure in our mind so we can be overwhelmed by the despair or the hopelessness or the trouble uh, they, they, we know in the news they said if it, if it bleeds, it leads, right? That we don't hear the success stories more than we hear the challenge and the triumph, the trials. I want you to know that not all information is equal. There are some moments in your life where you must create a kind of focus on the things that actually deserve your attention. What you're trying to do with the many in your life, the many people, the many thoughts, the many actions, the many experiences, God is saying, I am trying to help you get to the chosen few. You're focused on the many things, the many people, 
God says, I'm trying to get you to the chosen few people. You're focused on the many actions. God is saying, I'm trying to help you get clear about the chosen few actions. You're focused on the many experiences and the many bits of information. And God is trying to help us get clear about the chosen few. How do you get to that number? You may ask, well, I love how in this text, particularly in the Philippians text, Paul does the first thing in his, in his uh, letter. He starts with the end in mind. And that's the first thing I want you to do. Start with your end in mind. Come on, say that with me. Start with my end in mind. Again, Paul, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Paul says, listen, in order for you to be able to get to the clear will of God, the thing that you ought to think about perpetually, you must start with the end in mind. So rather than having this kind of openness to everything as it relates to what deserves your attention, you need to start with the end in mind. Start with what is true. Start with what is noble. Start with what is honorable. Start with what is just. And as you get clear about what is true, you ought to walk yourself back. Walk yourself back. Walk yourself back into clarifying what you let in your life. I hope this point is resonating and you're understanding what I'm saying. Because for some of us, we start with the beginning and have no sense of the end. And then our life feels like we are rudderless. We are just drifting without a destination. But you must remember that as a follower of Jesus, our end is already set. Victory is already yours. Power is already your salvation and liberation and joy and hope. And so if these things are already mine, what does it mean then for me to start with those things and make every effort to start to push out of my mind those things that do not contribute to the end that I know is already settled in glory. That there are some things, realities, that are connected to your future that are a promise from God. And if you start with the promise and work your way back, oh, I find, I believe, and I have come to know that your faith will give you what you need to press through the in-between moments. Lord, if I had some time, I'll talk to you about the in-between moments. The in-between moments of where you are now and your end. I want you to know, start with the end in mind. And while you're going in between the start and the end, God will give you what you need. The second thing that the scripture says that I love is that you and I, listen, let's make it a little, little, a little heavy, but I, I'm going to try to thin it out for you. Eschew scarcity. And embrace selectivity. Everybody say that. A shoe, that means reject, push away a scarcity mindset, and embrace a selectivity mindset, a discerning mindset. I want you to know that scarcity is not the same as selectivity. That just because you have a scarcity mindset, right, it, it, it does mean that you are, you're unable to believe that there is enough for you. And when you don't believe there is enough, you get pushed into desperate places, spaces, and choice making. God never calls for you and I to adopt a scarcity mindset. So you must reject scarcity. And this is why I love Paul when he says, whatever... Whatever is so broad, it's opening up a host of possibilities. Whatever, 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 it is not a limited starting place. It is a vast starting place. Whatever. But then Paul gets clear about the selectivity. Whatever is 
the expansive possibilities. But when he says true, it gets you and I down to selectivity, to discernment. And I want you to know, child of God, that you and I must eschew scarcity so we don't fall into desperation. There is more than enough for you. There is more than enough grace, more than enough healing, more than enough power, more than enough hope, more than enough victory, more than enough strength. There's more than enough for you. So don't you dare fall into a scarcity mindset and feel like you must grab a hold of whatever's in front of you because you're afraid that there won't be enough. No, there's more than enough for you. Somebody say that. There's more than enough for me. <laughs> but you must also, as you are a, a, a imagining and experiencing the more than enough, you must have the ability to discern whatever is true. You must be able to discern whatever is noble. You must be able to select what is reputable. You must be able to choose what is authentic, what is compelling, what is gracious, what is the best and not the worst, what is beautiful and not ugly, what are things worthy of praise. You and I must learn in these moments where we are surrounded by the ugliness of all of these challenges to ask God, give me a holy filter. Give me a sanctified colander. Give me a hopeful strainer. Give me something, a device that allows the whatevers that are in my life to be strained and, and selected down to what is true. Because not everything that comes your way is true. Not everything that comes your way is noble. Not everything that comes your way is authentic. Not everything that comes your way is worthy of praise. And if it is true that you and I have the ability to eschew scarcity and embrace selectivity, that means that we have the uh, power to decide what comes into our mind. And if you and I can have space for God to give us what we need through all that is at our disposal, you will have what you need as you go through your toughest trials. Lord, I'm here to tell you today that God wants to give you what you need, child of God as we go through these perilous times. And if you and I can make every effort to start with the end in mind, to eschew scarcity and embrace the possibilities and the selective things that are true, then as you do all that, the way you get down to the chosen few is you leave room for God's divine surprises. Leave space for God to make some choices. After you go through your whatevers, after you look and 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 you 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 imagine and you you take a broad a broad scope of all of the possibilities that are in front of you, invite God, invite the power of God's Spirit to give you a divine surprise. I I I love how how you know the early uh, Hebrews in the Scriptures because they were always anticipating the Messiah to come. Every time they did Passover, it was their custom to have a big Passover meal to set the table and to have everybody there as a family to sit there. But guess what? They always left an open seat at their table. They left an open chair just in case the Messiah decided to show up at their Passover meal. I want you to know that God is inviting you, child of God, leave an open chair. Leave an open seat. Leave some space for the divine surprise of God to show up in your life. Don't you dare get so uh, so filled with your own wisdom and your own ideas and your own fundamentalism, your own ideological slants and bents and ideas that you don't leave space for the mystery of God, for the transcendent wisdom of God, for the way out of no way that God does. My brother, my sister, make up in your mind, like the old song used to say, that my mind is made up. I'm on my way up. I'm going to hold my head up going on with the Lord. Why? Because if I keep going on with the Lord, God will blow and surprise my mind. God will give me what I need in order to make it through what I'm going through. Every time I 
press forward and press through, God will help the tricks that are going on in my mind. God will help those things that are being pushed into my mind to be overwhelmed and overcome by the power of God. I've been thinking a long time about what God requires of us in this moment and in this season. And our minds will play tricks on us and make us think that we still ought to be chasing the dollar and we still ought to be chasing the position. But I want you to know God doesn't need more of you to have more money. God doesn't need more of you to have more positions. God needs many of us just to have some peace of mind. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, my mind got to stop playing tricks on me. Stop showing me illusions. Stop showing me deceptions. God help me even in the state that I'm in to be formed in a way where I can say like the scripture says, I've learned to love God with my mind.